Genesis 48, verse 7. And as for me, when I came from Paddan, he mentions the death and burial of his wife Rachel, in order that the name of his mother might prove a stimulus to the mind of Joseph. For since all the sons of Jacob had sprung from Syria, it was not a little to the purpose that they should be thoroughly acquainted with the history which we have before considered, namely, that their father, returning into the land of Canaan, by the command and under the protection of God, brought his wives with him. For if it was not grievous to women to leave their father and to journey into a distant land, their example ought to be no slight inducement to their sons to bid farewell to Egypt, and at the command of the same God, strenuously prepare themselves for taking possession of the land of Canaan. Verse 8. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons. I have no doubt that he had inquired concerning the youths before he called them his heirs. But in the narration of Moses there is a hister on pteron. And in the answer of Joseph we observe, what we have elsewhere alluded to, that the fruit of the womb is not born by chance, but is to be reckoned among the precious gifts of God. This confession indeed finds a ready utterance from the tongues of all. But there are a few who heartily acknowledge that their seed has been given them by God. And hence a large proportion of man's offspring becomes continually more and more degenerate, because the ingratitude of the world renders it unable to perceive the effect of the blessings of God. We must now briefly consider the design of Moses, which was to show that a solemn symbol was interposed, by which the adoption might be ratified. Jacob puts his hands upon his grandsons. For what end? Truly to prove that he gave them a place among his sons, and thus constitutes Joseph who was one, into two chiefs. For this was not his wish as a private person. According to the manner in which fathers and grandfathers are wont to pray for prosperity to their descendants, but a divine authority suggested it, as was afterwards proved by the event. Therefore he commands them to be brought near to him, that he might confer on them a new honor, as if he had been appointed the dispenser of it by the Lord. And Joseph, on the other hand, begins with adoration, giving thanks to God. Verse 12. And Joseph brought them out. Moses explains more fully what he had touched upon in a single word. Joseph brings forth his sons from his own lap to his father's knees, not only for the sake of honor, but that he may present them to receive a blessing from the prophet of God. For he was certainly persuaded that holy Jacob did not desire to embrace his grandsons after the common manner of men. But inasmuch as he was the interpreter of God, he wished to impart to them the blessing deposited with himself. And although, in dividing the land of Canaan, he assigned them equal portions with his sons, yet the imposition of his hands had respect to something higher, namely, that they should be two of the patriarchs of the church, and should hold an honorable preeminence in the spiritual kingdom of God. Verse 14. And Israel stretched out his right hand, seeing his eyes were dim with age, so that he could not, by looking, discern which was the elder, he yet intentionally placed his hands across. And therefore Moses says that he guided his hands wittingly, because he did not rashly put them forth, nor transfer them from one youth to the other for the sake of feeling them, but using judgment, he purposely directed his right hand to Ephraim who was the younger, but placed his left hand on the firstborn. Whence we gather that the Holy Spirit was the director of this act, who irradiated the mind of the holy man, and caused him to see more correctly, than those who were the most clear-sighted, into the nature of this symbolical act. I shall avoid saying more, because we shall be able to inquire into it from other passages. Verse 15. God before whom. Although Jacob knew that a dispensation of the grace of God was committed to him, in order that he might effectual, why bless his grandchildren? Yet he arrogates nothing to himself, but suppliantly resorts to prayer, lest he should, in the least degree, detract from the glory of God. For as he was the legitimate administrator of the blessing, so it behaved him to acknowledge God as its sole author, and hence a common rule is to be deduced for all the ministers and pastors of the church. For though they are not only called witnesses of celestial grace, but are also entrusted with the dispensation of spiritual gifts, yet when they are compared with God, they are nothing, because he alone contains all things within himself. Wherefore let them learn willingly to keep their own place, lest they should obscure the name of God. And truly, since the Lord, by no means, appoints his ministers, with the intention of derogating from his own power. Therefore, mortal man cannot, without sacrilege, desire to seem anything separate from God. In the words of Jacob we must note, first, that he invokes God, in whose sight his fathers Abraham and Isaac had walked, 
for since the blessing depended upon the covenant entered into with them, it was necessary that their faith should be an intervening link between them and their descendants. God had chosen them and their posterity for a people unto himself, but the promise was efficacious for this reason, because, being apprehended by faith, it had taken a lively root. And thus it came to pass, that they transmitted the light of succession to Jacob himself. We now see that he does not bring forward, in vain, or unseasonably, that faith of the fathers, without which he would not have been a legitimate successor of grace, by the covenant of God, not that Abraham and Isaac had acquired so great an honor for themselves, and their posterity, or were, in themselves, so excellent. But because the Lord seals and sanctions by faith, those benefits which he promises us, so that they shall not fail. The God which fed me. Jacob now descends to his own feelings, and states that from his youth he had constantly experienced, in various ways, the divine favor towards him. He had before made the knowledge of God received through his word, and the faith of his fathers, the basis of the blessing he pronounces. He now adds another confirmation from experience itself, as if he would say, that he was not pronouncing a blessing which consisted in an empty sound of words, but one of which he had himself enjoyed the fruit, all his life long. Now though God causes his son to shine indiscriminately on the good and evil, and feeds on believers as well as believers, yet because he affords, only to the latter, the peculiar sense of his paternal love and the use of his gifts, Jacob rightly uses this as a reason for the confirmation of his faith, that he had always been protected by the help of God. Unbelievers are fed, even to the full, by the liberality of God, but they gorge themselves, like swine, which, while acorns are falling for them from the trees, yet have their snouts fixed to the earth. But in God's benefits this is the principal thing, that they are pledges or tokens of his paternal love towards us. Jacob, therefore, from the sense of piety, with which the children of God are endued, rightly adduces, as proof of the promised grace, whatever good things God had bestowed upon him. As if he would say, that he himself was a decisive example to show how truly and faithfully the Lord had engaged by covenant to be a father to the children of Abraham. Let us also learn hence, carefully to consider and meditate upon whatever benefits we receive from the hand of God, that they may prove so many supports for the confirmation of our faith. The best method of seeking God is to begin at his word. After this, if I may so speak, experimental knowledge is added. Now whereas, in this place, the singular gratitude of the holy man is conspicuous. Yet this circumstance adds to his honor, that, while involved in manifold sufferings, by which he was almost borne down, he celebrates the continual goodness of God. For although, by the rare and wonderful power of God, he had been, in an extraordinary manner, delivered from many dangers, yet it was a mark of an exalted and courageous mind, to be able to surmount so many and so great obstacles, to fly on the wings of faith to the goodness of God, and instead of being overwhelmed by a mass of evils, to perceive the same goodness in the thickest darkness.